There we go. There we go. There's a second there where the machine was not going to allow me to start. But we seem to have beaten it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for it. Peter, how you doing, buddy? It's what, a Thursday night in Ohio? It started cold, there it got go. warm, you know. Classic. There we go. Podcasting weather. It is podcasting weather outside, which is to say, like, anything to avoid having to face it. We're in now, Ohio. I mean, this is this is the way we've lived our lives for our less entire important, lives. Less important of where we are, it's when we are. And if you're one of the uh, listeners we currently have hanging out in the YouTube live chat window, uh, be advised that Joe and I are, in fact, 20 whole seconds in the future from you. <laughs> We're broadcasting to you live at this point, March 16th, 2023. 20 seconds in the future from you, plebes. Yes, my, and my wife wants everyone in chat to know that uh, she's reporting from the next room, which has all of the uh, the family animals <laughs> with her. Coincidentally, we my own wife is upstairs with all of my animals, my, my children. <laughs> she keeps them contained while daddy does his podcast in the basement talking about 20-year-old Trek. Well, I appreciate what uh you and 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 mrs peter that, that casey has done uh to enable us to talk about what was without a doubt the worst epi episode the worst season of star trek i have ever watched just not close not close what at a all old claim you know uh the most accessible thing to rival and that rival that up to would have been uh, season sucks, season six of uh, Voyager, and maybe that's the conversation we should have been get ready to have. Is was season two genuinely worse than season six? And honestly, I'd have to go back to the tape and and look at our review of those episodes because I think overall uh, season two improved its standing in my book immensely towards the back half. Oh sure, I agree. Ultimately, there was some redemption. Norman and Chats uh, trying to throw season two of Picard in as the worst. Unfortunately, That's, Norman, it's not really. Star it's Trek. not real Trek. Sorry, man. <laughs> you can't count it. Participation trophy, certainly. I I'll, I'll give it that. I mean, they tried and predating that would have been Picard season one, of course. But yeah, we're we're sticking to real Trek here, man. Although, I mean, we'll get to uh, what I would consider real Trek, which is, um. Season three of Picard. Uh, I know that I have a real uphill battle trying to convince you yeah. that that would be a, a fun thing to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe a number of our viewers are hard in the paint on the Picard season three along with me. We will we'll have some discussion about that. But, at, you know, we have to in first feast upon that, which we have labored these six months Week in and week out to produce for all of you. And that is season two of Enterprise. So, um... Let's start with the cold, hard truth. Because yeah. there's your feelings, there's my feelings, and mm -hmm. that's 20 years in the future. 20, 20 years and 20 seconds into the future. Hit me with some numbers on what viewership ended up looking at, because I think for all intents and purposes, it's season two that really killed the show, right? It was. So season one started out really strong, as I believe we might have recapped during our rip uh, for that. It, the the opener had a 12.54 million viewers, and it held a decent amount of those week to week, <clears throat> I would say, all the way through to Shadows of Pajem. So it slowly declined from 12 to 9 to, you know, was in the 7s and 8s for a while. And then Shadows of Pajem was the last time it was above 6 for the season. And it kind of languished in the 4s and 5s to finish. Season 2 started with only 4.89 million people watching the premiere. But built back up. And peaked at 6.25 million people. Would you like to know what episode saw the peak viewership for Enterprise Season 2? 
I'm going to go ahead and assume it's something that heavily involves Jolene Blaylock's boobs in the uh, decontamination as far as commercials would have gone. I don't believe that it was the worst offender in that, but I have no doubt that the promos involved some Jolene Blaylock sexy time because the episode that had the peak viewership of season two was A Night in Sick Bay. Oh, God. Why? How? What? Imagine... Imagine your leftover viewers who have stuck with you for this long. You you get as ma- you claw as many of them as you can back into your fold, only to give them a night in sick bay. Is that any? Is there any doubt why by the end of the season, three point eight eight million? A fourth. Uh, fuck the end of the season. I mean, by the next episode, which is Marauders, which is also terrible. Uh, yeah, to have the, as many people as possible watching a night in sick bay, that's maximum disappointment happening real time. So uh, I, I'm curious to the people we've got over there in chat. Did any of you initially try and watch Enterprise back in the early 2000s and have season two put the knife in your back that you couldn't get back in from? I mean, I, I, I've been open about my own experience when this was live. I didn't watch it at all. I I didn't even watch seasons one and two until I had already watched seasons three and four. And I believe this is the first time I've ever watched season two all in a row ever. I think every other time I've gone through it, it's been pieces, dribs and drabs. I think I did watch all of these episodes before. Some of them I didn't remember at all. It's crazy to think of going back and watching the show out of order and just still for your completionist sake, being able to say, uh, I watched all these without doing it chronologically. Like I get the initial watch forward from season, uh, the end of season two forward, but yeah. um, to just go through and just slowly assimilate them over time is crazy. So, you know, maybe that's a good place to start. We, we had alluded to it before. Um yeah, and, at and, the... you've, and you've got a couple of people who've weighed in in the chat. Norman saying he stopped watching season two regularly by the end. So it finally took him out. And uh, we've got Amanda who's saying uh, pieced out late season one or in season two. So these are these are folks that couldn't get through it. Couldn't couldn't manage to survive what what uh, Rick Berman was putting out there. And again, rightfully so. I have yeah. no desire to defend any of this. Even though, even the good episodes, I can't say. You know, season two was so the, the high points of season two were good enough to 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 pull people through the rest. So, uh, I, I want to make true on our um, desire. You know, if you're going to go out there and say, "Hey, give Enterprise a shot," what if anything really is worth hitting? Is is really worth hitting? Before just going right into um, episode 26, The Expanse, and, and really trying to give this thing a fair shake for it. And I think you're right. You know, your initial uh, prediction was just Broken Bow to get the layout and figure out who everybody's names are. And then the Andorian incident and Shadows of Pajem, which really establish, I think, really do probably short of stigma, the best job of framing. Uh, who are the 22nd century Vulcans and why are they motherfuckers? <laughs> yeah, like it, it it colors in some of the really important plot points that will get developed in season four. And that's why they're particularly important. The Andorians, the Vulcans, their relationship, how humanity uh, ceasefire from season two. Also part of that. So all of the Andorian episodes, I think you are worth watching. Uh, there are. You know, when we get into best episodes of the season, I think there's a couple more that are straight up worth it. One is another continuity piece, which is Judgment. Well, you know, let's let's start throwing some awards out there, and I think that's going to kind of flesh out the the conversation here. So, you know, true to our uh, rest in peace format, uh, the awards, right? And let's let's go right into it. What are your top three episodes for this season? Uh, my number one is uh, Canamar. Uh, space bogs, Con Aramar. Con Aramar. space bogs uh, adventure in and in, in affecting a prison bus break. It's probably just the best overall episode of the season. The it's 
funny, it's dramatic, it's tense, it has the the best use of their existing characters. Uh, you, you get good Archer, you get good Trip, you get the best space pipe scene of all time, you get Mayweather showing that his real role should be as the heavy. <laughs> just roll mm. it in. Mm. Uh, you get to Paul just like all business, solving problems off camera. <laughs> just, I am a space professional doing space professional things. I'm going to sort this out now. I will not, I will not be denied. It It's... The platonic ideal of Enterprise, I think, in a lot of ways. Like, this is probably the kind of show they were going for. That's worth watching just because it's good. Uh, my my second is Judgment. I think that I... My favorite, like, subplot line of Enterprise is the the state of the Klingon Empire and that it's a, it's a falling empire, not a fallen empire. So you still have... Um, institutions that are struggling to try and remain. You have you have Klingons who are part of those institutions that struggle with the state of of things and what to do next. And this is now this is something we continue to see as we get into season four. And so Judgment was an early preview of some of that content, and I really liked it. And then uh, lastly on my list here is Ceasefire, which uh, you know goes back to what we we're talking about. It's a key Andorian episode. You get some Shran. You know, I'm always down for some some combs in my life. It's also got Saval in it, so it's like the two best characters on the show <laughs> show up in that one. And you get Susie Plaxton, you know, beating the fuck out of John Archer, just just wailing on him, just yeah. kicking his ass. Uh, honorable mention to the Expanse, which is like a hard reset, like. What a pivot that they they try and 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 do there, and I don't really have much bad to say about it except how jarring it is, and how how just sudden a change it is. But it's it's effective at resetting the viewer into like this next season is going to be something different. Be ready. Um, so I will. It's not in my top three, but I, I wanted to mention that it's. It did a lot to try and like convince you to watch the next season quite effectively. Ah, Sweet Space Danny. Buckies. Are That's we talking Sweet Space Danny. Buckies right now? In the chat, yes. Uh, I can guarantee you there is zero sponsorship going on. I believe that whoever owns a large Texas gas station chain, the last thing they give a shit about is a Star Trek podcast. I'll have you know, I was at Bucky's this past weekend, um, and uh, I bought probably a hundred dollars worth of snacks. All beef jerky, I hope. I, I was so I was, you know, my my darling wife, big fan of of Bucky's, and re- had some requests. So I fulfilled those requests as well as mine. I will say the the barbecue sandwiches they reheat well. They reheat really well, so you can buy those and then. That's how you keep that top shelf podcaster body is with reheated gas station barbecue sandwiches. Absolutely. I mean, look at these guns. These lack of guns <laughs> I've got going on over here. All right, my guns, man. I'm going to bring out the big three ones. Uh, just like you, Judgment. And you hit the nail on the head across the board on those. I cannot not pick Judgment as it finally gave me a Klingon episode that I can call my favorite. Um, and again, the, the real crowning jewel of that is to have an episode of Star Trek where the thing I care about the least is what's going on with the ship. Real A+. Plus. Uh, For all the reasons I dislike Klingon stuff, again, the view of what did the Klingon Empire used to be and what are people who are there to witness its downfall doing as they watch this happen in real time. Phenomenal episode. That being said, I would not put, uh, you know, I don't think I put any of my top three uh, in the must watch prior to Expanse. Um, I I think a lot of stuff in season one and season two, the way you did it, it's cool stuff to come back to and flesh things in and be like, man, okay, that's why this is the way Hoshi is. Uh, oh, I see. This is why the the Klingons have a hard on for going after. Oh, wow. You know, this Borg episode, that, that's a neat kind of bonus content. And I think that's how I viewed a lot of this. The best of is it's not really doing stuff to the meta plot, the temporal cold war. Uh, but the, it's, it's just good Trek, right? So judgment easy for me. Uh, dead stop. 
right? That's the death stop, truck stop. Speaking I mean, that's why I got the Bucky shirt on. I was just calling. That's what I wore it for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That was a Roxanne Dawson directorial, I believe. That is correct. She was the voice of the computer. Uh, Yeah, that's right. Which, uh, you know, with the fucking mega missile, that's the second time she was crazy AI voice. Uh, Dead stop, I thought was a really neat. I don't want to say it's fringe sci-fi, but just the early Wild West unexplored frontier. The Federation is not a force. Uh, Nobody cares about Earth. There's a lot of other big stuff out there, and it's just the humans trying to map things around, like Velma having had their glasses knocked off and crawling around the floor and reaching out. Maybe Enterprise would have gotten out of there fine had Reed and, uh, and Trip not gone poking around and pissing things off. Maybe Mayweather could have survived, but... Uh, it's a great example of continuity. You know, uh, the Enterprise carrying the heavy battle damage it did from the minefield episode, needing to repair it. Really top notch CG work for the time, repairing the uh, inside and the outside of the ship real time. It, it is. It is. It is telling. I think that you, the season three wound up actually leaning into the idea of oh it's actually kind of interesting when enterprise has to suffer the consequences as time goes on of its choices Mm -hmm. and that it being isolated and alone as it explores space itself presents danger if it runs into too much trouble like there's no cavalry to come bail them out cool scary stuff going on with the uh the room of death where there's just a bunch of people being drained of all their wrist greases And a space station that's assimilating organics to use as, like, extra RAM upgrades. So there's, like, a sinister element. Uh, Cool life in space. I think Dead Stop would have also worked really, really good as a Voyager episode. And I wonder if on a certain level, like, that was an unused script. And if so, that's a shame because Voyager could have used more weird Delta Quadrant shit. Yeah, I didn't get that enough. Uh, And then my third pick was actually Catwalk. Hmm. And catwalk primarily for the reason that is able to set such an urgent tone which is a real miss with a lot of star trek crew members die or uh oh we're afraid of the space MacGuffin, and it doesn't really convey that sense of tense um brooding tone so uh you know leading in with this oppressive fear that everybody's going to be radiated to death fun uh guest stars you had uh, ed norton's boss from fight club in there a real good fake out in terms of who the bad guys were because at first it seemed very clear it was gonna be the weird alien guys and in fact it was their uh, doing their shinto death chants while eating yeah. their weird meat <laughs> instead it was their uh their fascist ex-bosses coming in with their gym teacher haircuts the, the effective space fascists they got very yeah. little screen time one of Let- the first times enterprise ever been able to create a creditable easy to hate bad guy that was still competent and not you know clown shoes i i I am a bit surprised that con aramar didn't make your top three i i thought like catwalk's pretty defensible choice i'm not gonna hate on catwalk that was that was a fun watch and the idea of them having to like lifeboat themselves and have to to MacGyver uh, a setup in there to do so was very interesting and very clever, but Con Aramar just seemed to have it all. Con Aramar wasn't bad. Um, I, I don't know. Sometimes you lose memories, get a little fuzzy around the edges. And going back and reviewing my notes, I was really into uh, Catwalk. Uh, on my reread, I, I, I might have. A- I might. Have, I think the it, the comedy element of Con Aramar is what probably made it more favorite. Because I am a comedy fan. I like oh, a little levity. Well, comedy in my was there in spades. I yeah. also want to give my honorable mention to uh, Stigma, which was the Space Aids episode. And I think that had the zany B plot of uh, Flox's wife wants to fuck had not been there to completely throw the tone off, uh, that would have been. Uh, a shoe in from one of my best three because again it does paint a great picture of the the distance that the Vulcans have to grow up uh, the plight that uh, T'Pol is carrying forward of her own design and nobly doing so uh, and you know forecasting problems she's going to have to resolve down the road also I'll count the terrible CG against it because that had some real 
It was pretty Bad dodgy. Hours. It was pretty dodgy all season, though. But really, all all of our stuff, I don't see minus ceasefire. You know, we're not picking anything that would be mandatory viewing. I'd say judgment is. I think judgment is mandatory really? because you put ju- I well, you don't know what's coming, so I have that knowledge. I know judgment becomes important. Fair enough. Let's talk worst episodes, Peter. Well, hold on. Before we jump on, was anybody picking a favorite in the chat that we need to shit on? Oh, well, I mean, I... I Zeevas put Carbon Creek in his top three. I was wondering... I, hold on. I, is, was that sarcastic, Zephus? Is, is that comedy? I think that's comedy. <laughs> I think, you're, I think you're, you're fucking with me, right? I'll tell you right now, Carbon Creek was my pleasant surprise award for this one like everything about that episode should have been dog shit and amazingly it came off i think i actually rated that as good not certainly not great but good and especially being on the front half of season poo that's quite the accomplishment to take 1159 and, and wrap it into something uh that i ended up digging so i'm not gonna shit on this pick <laughs> i i mean in right re- i mean at the time i think we were pretty harsh to it but if only we could put ourselves in the frame of mind that we would be later on right like that carbon creek was not offensive compared to some of the other things we're about to talk about claire calls something else interesting in there too good point on stigma reminding us that trip should have been the shoulder to support uh, to Paul that that was a big miss on that episode and that's one that still bothers me so yeah I think if you ditch the uh Flox's wife wants to fucking bring trip up to the front um yeah that that would have become top three for me for sure well it's even I mean we're, we're previewing our takes on because we we've recorded an episode already about season three for the premiere and the fact that we now know that they force march the relationship between trip and to Paul in absence of any of the character development that occurred in season two regarding the two of them, which was something we praised with how they kind of slowly built some reproachment between the two of them is all the more disappointing as you reflect on it. But let's talk bad Peter, because let me tell you, uh, three is not enough. I know we're limiting ourselves to three. I will limit myself to three. I will follow my own rules. But this season, it was actually, I, I mean, I, I don't I'll just peek behind the curtain a little bit for everybody. It was really hard to do the show this season. For the last six months, I have had to make myself get excited to record this podcast in a way that I never had to watching Voyager, where I would just be like, I have to fucking watch this show. And then I have to talk about it for an hour. Please, sweet, merciful Jesus, strike me down with a bolt of lightning to help me avoid this fate. Like, there were multiple times where these were the thoughts I was having. And um, I appreciate all of you, too, by the way, who stuck with it. I appreciate you as well, Peter. <laughs> you dragged yeah. you into this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, this was real bad. And I, I can't I can't really believe how bad it was. Like persistently D to F minus week after week for what felt like months. And um, yeah, it's not a shock. The show's viewership fell apart and never came back. I wouldn't have come back either. What surprises me looking at my overall rankings for this episode or this season, I only really came out with three that I would... Oh no, Peter. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> oh god. All right. Are we still here? You're here. You're back. You left for a moment. Well, the shittiness of season poo just like <laughs> dis- just just dis- ejected you from the stream momentarily. Yeah, we're going to start seeing everyone in chat be like, "Oh no, Peter." Yeah, I know it killed me. Uh I so I didn't really think that there was a uh, I would only call three episodes actual trash. I put three episodes of trash, five at bad, five at meh. And really, you know, meh is almost as bad as 
as Yeah, what bad. are your meh? Can I ask what your meh are? I didn't go as Shockwave deep. Part 2, The Communicator, Vanishing Point, Cogenitor, and Bounty, which half a bounty was great, and the other half a bounty was fucking off. Three of your five that are in meh, I would say, were flat bad. Which ones? Uh, communicator, uh, Vanishing Point, uh, basically not Bounty and not Shockwave Part 2. I forget what the fifth one you said was. Cogenitor? Cogenitor, yes. Flat bad, all three of them. Cogenitor saved itself by the shock ending of the Cogenitor killing themselves and, uh... I mean, I agree they're life. not... I agree they're not trash, but they're bad. They're not worth I, watching. My meh... And that's the saving grace because I'm a turbo nerd is that if I can take some cool part of lore or world building out, then it's not a complete time thief waste of my time and, and I can forgive some stuff. But okay. my generous trash, of you. Very. Am I not generous? Uh, my my trash here. Number one, night in sick bay mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, for the 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 evisceration of any fond opinion you can have of Jonathan Archer. Uh, a ridiculous setup. Um, all the sleeping in sick bay for his dog while the ship is dying on the vine around him. Ridiculous. Uh, my second pick, fucking Marauders, for just being infuriating on every level possible, from to Paul's Professor Disco outfit <laughs> to <laughs> having. Uh, Enterprise meddle in the affairs of uh, people in a situation where the, the outcome is clear. Either you kill the Klingons or they will come back and murder everybody. And then you've got the Hanna-Barbera level Scooby-Doo fight. <laughs> well, I mean, the Just worst an part all time of fucking turd. Yeah, but but there it is. The show has created very clear evil villains that you can go, OK. There's zero redeeming quality for these ship bags. They are outside of the Empire. Free hits on these guys. You can do whatever you want. Nobody's going to care. And them to go, you know what? We're going to catch them. They might as well just put a fucking lasso off a tree. And then, you know, the Klingons go over and pick up an apple and get whisked upside down. Yes. That would have that would have been more believable than what they did as like a, a genuine action on their part. So uh, Marauder was a trash fire. And then as you twisted my arm behind my back and forced me to come to the conclusion that uh, Precious Cargo not for the obvious reason that the uh, lead guest actor was a bad actor but that it's just terrible writing and nobody has any excuses for why uh, everybody in the ship is as dumb as they are why we could not have villains any you know the, the kidnappers uh, be anywhere near the level that they should have been in terms of plausibility or feasibility. And I don't, man, I think it was just a fucking drag to watch. It, it was fun to revisit that episode in preparations for the stream and, and go back through that. You were not convinced it was bad as I, I thought it was. And then I slowly talked you into that position by the end. You were pissed, pissed at it as I was. I don't even think you were aware of how bad it was until we really fleshed the conversation and got into like the meat and potatoes on. Oh, I called episode. I called it the worst episode of Star Trek ever made from the start. Don't yeah, you but, dare! <laughs> but still, I mean, I was... you, you had a, you had a couple moments where where depths were unlocked lower. There were oh yeah, like I, I I started low and I went lower. I, okay. I my I had hateful impulses came forth that I didn't know I still had within me. And and so I'll get into mine. Uh, frankly, we we are we share some similarities here. Uh, I my number one worst one is Precious Cargo. I think that uh, the the script is inexcusably bad. I cannot understand how that went forward, and I don't know how you film one scene with Padma Lakshmi and not say. No, we can't do this. Like, this is going to be embarrassing for you. Like, we can't let you do this to yourself. I don't care. If I, I mean, if you just need, if you really just want a a, a a hot model to play your space princess, you you have to be able to do better than that. I, I, there's got to someone in LA is better than that. Okay, find them, find them, pay them scale. They'll be so happy. 
Find some starving waitress trying to break into the industry. I think it's a family friend calling in favor. It, there, it, was some, it, there was some level of nepotism. Taft Hartley them in the sag <laughs> and go. I think that's a dirty Hollywood hand job of some sort or another. Yeah. I, to the point where you've got uh, Bran Braga, I think, saying, hey, can we not air this? Yeah. And I don't it, think that was like a cheeky, fun joke that was like, this was a mistake. We got to like DVD bonus content this and and my second worst is Night in Sick Bay, which is th- the worst episode of Star Trek where it's just your main characters, right? Like Precious Cargo was particularly bad because it was like poorly written and then like focused on this guest star. And so the focus wasn't even on like the, the characters and the things you know. And Night in Sick Bay was just the characters that you have, you know, doing what you would call a traditional bottle episode. And I don't know, would you call it character assassination? Um, I think Night in Sick Bay is going to be my dear doctor. I cannot get past in my head that Jonathan Archer, the captain of the NX01, the foremost explorer slash scientist slash pilot slash engineer that Starfleet has ever produced, a scion of of Earth, uh, you know, royalty essentially because his father invented the engine, and that, he that, goes on to become the president of the Federation. Yeah, like that. He yeah becomes the president of the Federation, forms the Federation as the primary uh, war leader against the Romulans and Earth Romulan War, like. This guy who's one of the most important people ever to live, and he brings his fucking dog down to a contentious first contact and is pissed that somehow they're pissed that it peed on a sacred tree and that they want a lot of piss. Yeah, like none of this makes sense. Who wrote this? Did the did the writers of Picard season two travel backwards in fucking time and do that one? Did Q whisk them away to ruin Star Trek retroactively? I cannot, for the life of me, otherwise find a rational explanation for its existence. It is god-awful, and it is only not the worst thing because precious cargo happens to also exist. (laughs) You know? Like, not because there's a single sliver of satisfaction that a human could possibly get from that garbage, but merely because there's something a shade darker right next to it. Well, speaking of uh, taking humor from dark places, let's uh, let's let's go to a fun place here. Oh, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I, I got to give you my third. Okay, <laughs> I'm not done yet. All right. Oh man, All I've right. been waiting for this moment. All right. So my 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 challenge here for the third one is that I saw your third worst first because it's in our shared drive document that yeah. we share here to collect our notes for these live streams, and I saw you picked Precious Cargo Night and Sick Bay and Marauders, and I thought to myself. Can I rationally pick something other than Marauders? Is there, upon close examination, an episode that I can say with a straight face for the sake of variety and discussion mm. was actually worse than Marauders? And I really th- this was the thing I thought about the most in my preparation. Okay? I really went through the episodes. I really thought about things. I went back. I listened to some clips in the different episodes and really tried to figure it out. And I'm going to say yes. Singularity was a worse episode than Marauders. Not by a lot. Not by a lot. But Singularity was just the one I hated to watch the most because it was so boring and annoying. And it was just all embarrassing. embarrassing. Like the crew just got bitchy with each other. And like T'Pol basically had to concuss Archer out of being. A shower woke him up. A shower, Radiation poisoning. And yeah. this, a lot of times, too, when we're talking like bad Trek out of uh, Voyager, out of Enterprise, it becomes so much worse when you can sit there with five minutes of discussing an episode and say, there's a way better way to do this that would not have been R-rated or whatever and really been a, something great. And this was a legit opportunity to tell some startling space madness, space madness, uh, and, and they squandered it. It, it was a tonal fuck up of like, is this a slapstick comedy episode or is this supposed to be real? It was comedy that wasn't funny and drama that wasn't compelling. One of the two. It was awful. And I think it was worse than Marauders because at least 
Marauders made me laugh. It did. I thought I was amused by how bad it was, and that that makes it not as bad to me. Yeah, I if I had to go back and rewatch either Singularity or Marauders, I think Marauders would certainly be more entertaining. Yeah, not a not a just a fucking time thief and. Gosh, maybe I need to downgrade Singularity. <laughs> so, with you wanted to move on to one of our more fun topics. What did you have New in one. mind? Best comedic act of violence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there's only one and, winner. And really, you there's... know, uh, <laughs> real, real quick, my my breakdown for this action level because that's something I've really had my eye on is uh, is this a sci-fi show or is this an action show set in space? Space American Cowboys, right? I think for season two, I came out with. Seven episodes, I said those were no violence. Seven, there was low violence. One with medium violence. Ten with high violence. So uh, kind of a turnaround in a lot of ways from season one that was way more action-oriented. So, so what are your what are your entrants into this? I know exactly what mine is, and I don't think there's any way to dethrone it, but I'm happy to discuss options. Um, the Klingons getting rounded up in Marauders without anybody actually killing a Klingon, which was hilarious yes uh trip getting uh reptile spit in his eyes some straight up mortal combat that was a good one prevented him from fatality getting his fatality off i, mm-hmm. I trip def- busting the nasakin over the head with a giant wrench gosh i wonder I what know. will win <laughs> <laughs> uh somehow nobody shooting senator kelly in the seventh when everybody had every chance to stop <laughs> this guy before he ran away and everybody just gave him uh, fair escape. It's, it's, you mean like including Archer, who is standing there, basically uh, uh, doing the Shia LaBeouf routine to Paul? Do it, dude! Just do it. Everybody, just complete clowns. Uh, my winner, hands. Yeah, well, hands were down. Was Hoshi bicycle kicking Flox in the dick? Uh, that Repeatedly. was good. That was good. That was great. We've got a gif. It was excellent. Uh, Reed getting stabbed by the mine was kind of funny. Um, the cartoon even more funny as I've grown to hate Reed as a character. <laughs> it's funny because he might have died. Again. <laughs> I, I got to go back and watch him get uh, injured again for laughs. Uh, the cartoonish uh, cloaked fight in the communicator was really kind of uh, was was dumb. And then the entire episode of Singularity certainly had what I would call comedic acts of violence in it. But really, to me. It's nothing is going to beat the sheer artistry of Trip hitting Nausicaan with the giant with the giant space wrench. I mean, the setup to to put the Nausicaan in the position and then like the slow pan over to the fact there's a giant wrench right there. that Trip just pulls off the wall and this that last comedic line of like, yeah, I think you're on it. Just then just just dunks on him. <laughs> just concusses him right there and then. You're never going to beat that for comedic violence. That's just 10 out of 10. No notes. Where do you want to go from here, Joe? Uh, well, uh, someone sexy? brought up uh, someone. Someone. Well, someone brought up in the chat. And I, 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 we don't necessarily have notes on this, but it's, it would be a fun thing to talk about for a second. The script pen. Your famous. Your famous. Uh, we did a lot of that uh, this season, and uh, you have a – well, I guess you do have a category here, biggest plot botch, where you've oh, summarized, I think, a, a lot of your best – season? Yeah, I think this is a lot of our best plot fixing notes, and I kind of want to go back over them because it – our discussions where we very quickly and off the top of our heads came up with far more compelling plot points that would have – really salvaged a lot of these garbage episodes and potentially even made them great simply by changing what character you put in that situation or changing like the focus. I'd like to go back over this because it, it, I mean, to be fair, hindsight's always 2020, oh. you know, it's easy. It's easy to go back and criticize, but there's a lot of stuff like for, for a writer's room of paid professionals who should have enough time to sit there and, and walk through what's happening in these episodes and who should theoretically uh, have enough knowledge of what the show is about, what the characters are about, and the story they're trying to tell. Like, there's so many big misses. And, you know, going back to our earlier discussions from season one and into season two about just burnout, Berman and Braga just burned out from running 
um, Voyager. A creatively and, spent and, uh, franchise. And I get it, it you like. know. I'm at work. I'm doing my shit. I'm a professional. You're a professional. I'm just being like, man, the fucking water heater broke. And I'm worried about like what this plumber is going to charge me. Uh, the car's back. Right. Tires making a weird squeak. What am I going to get my wife for her birthday? Uh, you know, just a million things running through. My, my, my heart and soul is not in my work all the time. And on spreadsheets for financials or whatever, no one's going to notice that. When you're putting stuff out with a rabid fan base, that stuff's going to get picked apart and i i will never apologize for the amount of shit and and microscopic nitpicking that we do because everybody involved in voyager everybody involved in enterprise everybody was involved in next generation you knew what you were getting in bed with you knew the fan base you were catering to and that's a dance with the devil that you walked into with your arms open yeah and frankly i think our our edits, our changes, they were all good faith discussions. It was, you could have done this story. You just needed to change it in this way. Like, there is, I think, a, a section of fandom, and I was going to get into this a little bit with my thoughts about Picard. They get way too wrapped up into the minutia instead of the nuance, which are two different things. The nuance is how are we feeling our way through the story that you've intended to tell? How can we improve that by finding the right lane to get into? And the minutia is, oh, this this detail wasn't quite Did he right. Push the right button. You didn't. On yeah, the panel? you didn't use the we right piece of techno babble. Blah 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 blah. Like minutia is annoying. Nuance is interesting. And. We get into some of that with our notes. Like you have here, Vanishing Point Transporter Story. Great idea. The great idea of like Hoshi in particular being your character that you use to tell the story of like, oh, wow, this whole transporter thing is still new. And we may have accidentally created some sort of Lovecraftian uh, soul-sucking mind torture device because you just went on this adventure in your own uh, mind over the course of like 12 seconds to your rematerializing. But Tell me in the mirror universe that they keep that version of the transporter <laughs> on file and it is a go-to interrogation just to endlessly loop people through six seconds of hell. I, it, effective. Effective. And then they just kind of blew it by having this super... C minus D plus episode instead of, of going all in on this horrific story that they had given gifted to them uh, using trip instead of Hoshi and cogenitor. Uh, we, we were like, this story works. If you just use your most, uh, n you know, your newest, youngest, uh, not really wanting to be their s space person and have Let them throw one in here. Up. Um, I didn't come up with it until later when I was uh, back discussing in the uh, first flight Facebook entry. But, oh, we all need to care about action. Grandpa, he's this loved hero and blah, blah, blah. And and, and the uh, Harry Kim's Canadian girlfriend, you know, here's this character. You need to care about him. Take the ridiculous ending where you have two Starfleet officers stealing the prototype ship going off on a, a rogue flight to try to prove that the platform works and violating global policy of uh, Starfleet leadership and both of them just coming out with like a one month suspension. Ridiculous. And then Archer going on to becoming the captain of the first deep space vessel. All ridiculous. Uh, let, let me plot pen that one real quick for anybody who didn't read it. Archer's going to go do the test flight. Action Grandpa confronts him. I know what you're doing. Uh, you can't do this. I ruined the space program because I didn't bail out when I was supposed to. You've got big things in your future. I think you got the right stuff to carry humanity forward. Someone's got to do this and it cannot be you. Let me jump on their grenade. Let me do the flight. Let me get uh, court martialed, even though it kills Forrest to do it. And now when you find out your this guy, Action Grandpa, died on Mount Everest or whatever, it's, hey, this is a guy who sacrificed everything to keep the space program going and uh who gave me the ultimate gift of letting me stay back so i didn't have to fall on the sword to save my dad's design uh, and now here's a great reason to care about action grandpa and why we're going to name this nebula after him and this justifies this fucking long you know all, all these porn 
uh, these porn set bars, <laughs> fist fights, and and all this other crap. Here's the 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 hero's journey action Grandpa needed to go on. It was probably your best change, in my opinion. Like, because we were pretty low on that one, and I think that changing that framing by just making it so the action Grandpa takes the affirmative steps on his own and protects Archer from all of this and then basically sets him up as the golden boy as a way to, to as, as, as a servant leader, essentially he's sacrificing his own desires and his own career. And that's why Archer and trip and forest all fucking love this guy. And it's why they're shattered by his death because they yeah. know everything that they've managed to succeed came as a consequence of him being willing to make that choice. Instead, you get the fucking dog shit that we did with Trip launching a spacecraft off a fucking plastic parts tray. <laughs> like, great job, guys. 10 out of 10. Yeah. My other biggest plot, Botch, I, I'd want to call out to then is going back into regeneration. Bringing the Borg out. I, I've never seen an episode that I hate and love so much at the same time. And I think you could have told a really savage story of death and destruction uh, and still been able to pull out from the lasting consequences, just throw Q in there, throw the time cops in there, something to to wish it away, and a, kind of a cool what if. So what if, Peter, we had to hand out a, an award for best sexual objectification? <laughs> uh, <laughs> most gratuitous. Be- best? Um, crassest? Yeah. Uh, the most prominent example of sexual objectification. Uh, I did not actually list my... I thought at first one of your two nominees was going to be it. But I, upon reflection, I think there is a third option that may be superior. So you have listed the Shadow Nips. The famous Carbon Creek Shadow Nips, which seemed like a real front runner to me absolutely heavily discussed already in the chat yes like i think we really broke some people's brains when we pointed out like look how they linger on that look how much time they spend in high definition in high def on a shot just so you can see jolene blaylock's nipples in shadow what this is a choice and they made it Twice. She goes back to the well. Yes. She gets Twice. And then, of course, fucking bounties, decon room to Paul, horny to fuck flocks, like almost comedic in how pandering it is. But a third option. I'm going to enter the third option into the chat. Shockwave part two. Hoshi coming out of the 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 vents and losing her top oh my God. for no reason. <laughs> How did I forget that? You know, it's it's been cause, a while because <laughs> Jolene Blaylock has the crosshairs on her boobs so frequently. I just figured it was uh, they were cemented there. I completely forgot about that. Which one are you going to go with, Joe? I mean, I I still think that the shadow nips is just because it was such a choice, right? They at least wrote a plot around the decon chamber thing. It was an excuse, but there was a plot behind it. The shadow nips were just, were going to shoehorn this into this episode somehow. We got our lead actress's top off and we're going to find a way to get some PG titty in there. And And they found it and then they made sure to do it fucking twice in the same scene. Joe, I'm going to take a page out of your book and I'm going to I'm going to have a challenger appear that is not on our lists. Uh, and I'm going to go back to stigma and the ridiculous uh, parallel messaging which was on one hand um, unwelcome sexual attention is bad and basically <laughs> rape, which was right. uh, the Vulcan Cenobite cult leader trying to get her into the cult to the point where, you know, he's forcing mind melds on her and, and ostensibly raping her. 
contrasted by the zany B plot of Flox's wife wants to fuck. And even though Trip tells her no and tries pumping the brakes as hard as he can, the show script just pushes it forward because gosh darn it, that's funny. And Trip's <laughs> such a Trip's, Trip's such a snack. She'd be crazy to let him go. And just the bonkers objectification that uh, early 2000s TV is cool with, with saying, hey, you know, guys need to fuck and uh when a girl says no it means no so uh, a lot of contenders here uh i guess you could also say hoshi being trapped in her sporty spice outfit and vanishing point that's my (laughs) most 90s moment that's your most 2000s moment yeah yeah um you could have included that but yeah i i'm still partial to the shadow nip and apparently it was claire who was the one who was like i never fucking noticed that like i'm glad we could ruin that for you (laughs) <laughs> I'm glad we can supply that uh, that to you. Uh, so most 2000s moment years was trapping Hoshi in the Sporty Spice outfit, mm-hmm. which is very period appropriate. Mine was Trip trying to bring freedom, trying to bring America to Cogenitor. I mean, I don't think you, I don't think you can really beat that as a 2000s thing. But I guess that's more specifically a United States. 2000 thing so your option may have the most international appeal right being a reference to the spice girls and we have a lot of (laughs) international watchers not live because they're in like weird time zones where it's like 4 a.m there where are we going from here joe and there's a lot of options i think we need to do some of our our usual staples yeah uh we haven't done weakest shit and we have so mm. many things to talk about mm. here. Okay. That also encapsulates a lot of the big talking points for this season. So, Guys, I didn't even get to write anything down. And this is everything Peter already had listed before I even had a chance to add anything. Okay? Don't Zero. read the first one because that's, my, that's my, my winner, I think. Okay. I won't read the first one. Uh, cutting Hoshi scene from The Expanse. Uh, the way Reed escaped death in Minefield. Phlox shoving Archer at... Uh, a to pull sex fantasy in night in sick bay Klingons walking away with, <laughs> with a fat L of marauders and never coming back an enterprise for not killing them. How uh, wasting transporter phobia on vanishing point, especially the weird setup at the beginning that forced the issue such that they had to transport, which made no sense. Uh, precious cargo's judge scam judge to Paul. Yeah. And, Mine, which is Archer brought his dog on a first contact. Man, there's some real hate for Reed going on in the in the chat over here. Yeah, what a way to try and turn Porthos into the bad. That's the real crime. There's Porthos is a good boy. He's a great dog. He's a beagle that doesn't bark except at at villains. <laughs> like That's he's a good guy. Very clearly genetically engineered. Yeah, I mean the future is unlocked. All kinds of good boy tech. Uh, I want to really focus in for a second. Cutting the Hoshi scene from The Expanse was miserable. Y- y- Hoshi, of my complete apathy towards all these characters and-, and no fucks to give about anyone, like Hoshi is on the higher end of my favor. And she has had a pretty solid journey, cohesive journey from the beginning of the season where she was just along for superficial fun uh, to be scared shitless in the the spider space spider people episode and going, I'm in way over my head, butting heads with T'Pol and and all of this thing kind of wrapping together to T'Pol guiding her, her genuinely trying to improve who she is as a person and an officer. And by the end of the season, realizing that uh, she needs to be on this crew to help them and through her own accomplishments, is able to stand with them in competency and solidarity and to completely take that payoff away from her before, as best I can tell, just shoving her in as a occasional guest star background actor is a real crime. My weakest shit, though, Joe, uh, it, going back into Regenerations, and again, I said it's an episode I hate, it's an episode I love, but concept that you're going to go up against the Borg on multiple encounters yeah, and not a single Enterprise crewman dies to the fucking Borg that brought the 24th Century Federation to its goddamn knees 
is the weakest shit of season two and inexcusable. I don't know and, what they're and saving. And yet, the somehow, f- that was still the most effective the Borg have been since First Contact. They're, like, clearly the most threatening and mysterious and deadly the Borg were since that movie. They, surpassing all Voyager episodes. So, what do you put in your... Uh... Your weakest shit on my my weakest is definitely Archer bringing his fucking dog to first contact. Like, I guess you could say all of a night in sick bag could represent the weakest shit because it was like one of several bizarre, incomprehensibly weak nonsense that they decided to have Archer do from the dog to being petulant about it to refusing to apologize to to having to basically be talked into doing his fucking job, <laughs> like. Somehow, like, he felt he was above, he was above having to do it. Uh, to Paul really working hard to try and get him to realize he's being a petulant child. Everybody, everybody around him. I mean, to the point you even piss Flox off. And I think that's the only time I've legit seen Flox get mad at somebody. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was a real low point. And you could throw that whole episode right in the fucking trash where it belongs. Who was your best character, Peter? I want to say Mayweather because he (laughs) went from being one of the worst. (laughs) Oh, that's spicy. It is spicy. Uh, By the end, I genuinely enjoy his presence. Um, I think they got better at writing his character. Uh, Space Truckers 2. What was that called? Uh, Well, we called it Warp 2 Blues. I think Horizon was the name of the episode. Horizon. You know, that, that did him a lot of favors. Uh, and I think they found the right way to use them, which is minimal dialogue, solid bro moments, and, um, and they flesh them out well. But I, I think looking at the expanded cast, you know, last year, or I'm sorry, last season, Shran was both of our top picks. This one, I'm going to go to the other side of the coin, Suval. He only gets to be in a couple episodes, but they flesh his character out, and it really does him big favors across the board. Because he was a cool character already. But finding out that he was former intelligence, finding out that he's got all this nasty beef with the Andorians over whatever little stupid colony that was. Uh, The begrudging respect he starts affording Archer, culminating in the expanse where he's really trying to pump the brakes hard on this crazy idea that they're going to go off to space hell. Nebula. It's true. He tries to bro him up. Uh, Watching him make sacrifices against his better judgment and ceasefire and really give uh, peace a chance. Uh, cool, cool stuff happening. And I think my favorite stuff with him is when he's in his private scenes around to Paul and he kind of lets the act go down and like the real talk they're able to have. Do you call him Suval because it's part of your bit of not pronouncing things correctly? Or do I don't know what's his name. Soval. Gary Graham. This is why I call him Gary Graham. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, I I went with I went with Shrad again. <laughs> like in fucking two episodes. Dude. I I I I don't. I think I I don't get care. off Jeffrey's dick. I can't. I can't get off. Uh, I I still think that he was. He's only one episode, but he's still my favorite character. But my I guess my actual answer is Flox. I think Flox had some really cool stuff in. Uh, was it? was the episode where they were clearing the planet off the breach. He was dealing with having to like the, the basically his, his prejudice and like his that family. Was What's that? That was super solid. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a, that was the script spiking the ball ups or setting the ball, the volleyball up so we could come in and spike it hard. Yeah. And uh, it was probably the most compelling character work of anyone in the whole season amongst the main cast. So, I also really enjoyed Phlox having to eat crow and, you know, realize that uh, he's making some stupid space decisions out there in regeneration when he gets stabbed with the tubules and uh, basically almost kills himself to save himself. Yeah, that, and I also wanted- that was like some good horror for him and that he really like took it on himself in a very heroic fashion up to and including like giving like Archer a spray. Like it doesn't work. Just fucking kill me. 
And here's another entry into the weakest shit is the fact that bad script decisions and editing decisions uh, robbed Hoshi of being the best character this season. I think had they kept that last scene in that they cut from Expanse where she tells Archer that she's in it to win it, had they given her co-genitor and a little bit more screen time and not made Vanishing Point a complete fucking garbage fire, um, she, I think, would have been a shoo-in for this award. Yeah, yeah. I, I We have discussed in nauseam, I think, at this point, but I guess this is the rip, so it's a good time to review, that Hoshi had so much potential as a character on this show uh, that where they positioned her as really reluctant to be there and doing so out of a personal loyalty to someone that we highly suspect based on how the actors are reading the material were intended to be ex uh intimates former partners how you know uh they were in a relationship like it just gives that whole vibe and it's so interesting it's so unlike anything else that we've seen in trek in terms of Oh, my ex girlfriend's one of my officers that I had to fucking talk into coming because she's the old, like the biggest language genius uh, available on earth, and they what just do saying, nothing with it. Ultimately, who are you saying your worst is this season? I, I mean, is there answer any answer other than read? Well, let me let me yeah okay. Well, do you want to entertain a non read option? I don't think I can with a straight face. Well, Archer. Archer is the worst character in season two because uh, while Reed is terrible and shits up any scene he's in, ultimately he's not in that many scenes. This is a show about three people. It's Archer, it's DePaul, it's Trip. You see Archer so much and so much of the time you see him, he is just portrayed in the worst possible light. And in Star Trek, you cannot make a show where you dislike if not borderline hate the fucking captain of a ship where you're constantly yeah. sitting there with common sense answers. Like I get, he's a new, he's the first Starfleet real captain out there and that they didn't train for this stuff. And that, you know, you're, you're, you're doing things for the first time. There's a right way and a wrong way to make people learn lessons along the line on the job. And the lesson that he has to learn over and over again is don't be a douchebag. Don't be a crybaby. Don't be a petulant bitch. And it takes, I don't know if he's even really learned the lesson on that yet, but and it's stupid to have him learn that lesson. Like, why? What a fucking stupid choice. Just so, no, it's not something anyone wants. It's not compelling. It's not interesting. There's... And also too, Reed. at least I can look at and say, this is what this character is supposed to be. About. He would be better off as a science officer who is pissed that the Vulcan bumped him out of the top chair seat. But you know, I can say, he, he's a he's a military guy who is kind of uh, creepy and prone to violence and a hothead. And this is the way this character is portrayed. Archer, I still can't tell you, like, who... If I was to sit here and describe Archer, you know, Picard was the diplomat, Cisco was the engineer, uh, Kirk was the wild card um, brute, right? Yeah, and, and, and uh, you had uh, Janeway as the scientist. Uh, who's Archer? Archer is good at comforting you if you get bad news about a family member. That's what I can tell you off the top of my head. Yeah, and I think we ex explored the concept. Like, his positioning was to be the explorer, to be Lewis and Clark. You know, just to be willing to... Ex like, if Kirk was a wild card in the sense that he was willing to be aggressive, he's more the warrior. Uh, whereas Archer could have been the intrepid explorer, willing to yeah. ford the creek to get the wagon across. And... Instead, they made him a petulant man-child and makes you hate him. But I still think Reed's worse. Like, Archer actually had some interesting... Did you hate Reed this much your first watch? No. Is Reed commonly known in the fandom as uh, as as sour of a character as we're reflecting? Cause I'm seeing a lot of people in chat just astoundingly disliking Reed. I don't know if this is their feelings prior to listening to us talk about episodes or if this is kind of a journey that we have all gone through as a group Whew, what a good question i don't know i have no idea reed i i can't imagine anyone likes him you know like i don't does anyone have bad enough taste to like 
read. I don't think so. It's not even about liking, so. just hating reading. I think, like many things, that Enterprise just wasn't popular enough and people were just weren't tuned out enough to give a shit. Again, jump That's back true. to Vox Sola, uh, a episode about the Enterprise crew being eaten alive by a giant uh, cum shot and that I never heard about this zany episode <laughs> Uh, until I sat here and watched it. You couldn't hear enough about, uh, you know, Tom Paris banging lizard babies out with our cap with the captain, sure. but yeah, you didn't hear about the cum monster. Just nobody cares about enterprise. And why would you, anybody, you know, waste their breath shitting on read on the internet? I feel like we've covered enough about season two of enterprise. I think we have any big discussion topics out in the audience. You guys want us to hit before we move on? You know, we, we, we've said it couple times um but we'll say it once more this was without a doubt the worst season of star trek that you and i have done for this show it was painful and difficult to get through and i cannot recommend that you watch the whole thing and to the extent you watch any of it it should be strictly limited to some very a very small handful of worthwhile episodes and things that lead into further continuity uh we're being asked if we're ready for season three and if we're excited i can say not be yeah we are super excited we i mean i think our review of the expanse said a lot that like oh okay this is interesting and yeah we we've started (laughs) we started recording our our episodes about that spoiler alert we like it uh (laughs) but um you know it's it, it it's still uh it's it's a long road from from here to there and uh i i've never felt it more uh than doing it in the fashion that we did and it just is no fucking shock that the show got canceled and never recovered its audience even though it got better so with that done can we spend a few minutes talking about picard would that be okay yes, peter sir. would you yes, entertain sir. that Sure. I appreciate your grudging acceptance. Yeah. <laughs> I can, it's, I mean, did you see the Discord today? Did you see the Discord? No. A lot of people are liking this show. Um, I'll say this. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Um, Raffi is still in it. And she is... Michelle Hurd is still the worst actor to ever be on Star Trek. And obviously nothing can fix that. So there are still minutes that you have to endure with her being on screen and you can't just skip it because it's the stuff Worf is in and Worf is awesome. So it's like, you don't, you don't want to skip it because then you miss the Worf content, but you're stuck. You're stuck with the Raffi to get the Worf content. So there's, there's a real struggle there. Uh, but what if I told you, Peter, the, the, there's a season eight of TNG and you can just go watch it? Let's assume that Picard finishes as strong as you're feeling for it right now. Would you say that season three of Picard is better or worse than Deep Space Nine? Ooh. Uh, better than Deep Space Nine. Oh come on, really? Yeah. Let me let, let, give me twenty seconds to watch the chat light up and uh, and burn you at the stake here. I don't think they're going to. Not after not after episode five. Anyone who's watched episode five, I think. I mean, it, here's it, here's it, what I'm going to say is that uh, I have not gotten around to watching Deep Space Nine twenty some years later. Uh, there's a lot of great TV out there that I have limited amount of time to watch, and I foolishly gave uh picard season one what 10 episodes of my life it's true and it pooped in my eyeballs it with did. diarrhea it did and i blinked and it got stuck under my eyelids and yeah. it cost us uh listeners in the process so uh, i'm glad that you are are loving it and there's still a couple episodes i think for this thing to take your face and slam it in the corner of a table <clears throat> uh but I'll get around it at some point, but I am certainly not chomping at the bit. You got a, you got a big ask here to, to I know, back I know with the first stuff four. Here. I mean, 
first two episodes kind of set a lot of stuff up. They're a little slow. Season so uh, episode three, things really pick up. Episode four, I really thought like, oh, this must be the peak. This is really good. Oh, really hold on feels a second. Like- I got I got to be right for a minute here. Uh, the chat has caught up with us. Deep Space Nine is the best series. No way it's better. DS Nine's amazing. DS Nine uh, is best track than Strange New Worlds. Eh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Yeah, no, nobody's supporting Joe's claim here, so I will watch Picard after DS9. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now, I can, like, offer you a spoiler to see if, like, that hooks you. Would you like that? No. Mm-mm. Are you sure? You don't want You don't want to know spoilers. what you're missing? Like, I, listen, the pure I, genius you're missing? No. I, okay. I'll get around. Dude, I don't like trailer i don't even watch trailers for the fucking i mean back when i cared about star wars like if i know at some point i'll get around to it it's there but uh you know we'll see where you what song you're singing by the end once uh, the full season wraps because it's always possible for them to fucking tank this thing but um yeah, the, ep- the episode they put out today, episode five, has convinced me that Terry Metalis knows exactly what the fuck he's doing. But Terry and Metalis this, was this involved gonna... in the last two seasons, though, man. Like, no, he was only it... inv- he was involved in season in, in season two, and didn't really have much a role, much of a role in what they had decided to do with that, and wound up doing season three because no one wanted to, and they were contractually obligated for their international streaming contract to do three seasons. Okay, so. No one wanted to. Everyone knew the show was dog shit. Everyone left. Akiva Goldman's doing Strange New Worlds. Alex Kurtzman can't be bothered because he knows Trek has has slipped his grasp and he's off making a movie or something. And someone had to do it because they Amazon's paying to have this thing made. If you were, if you remember, they paid for the international streaming rights a long time ago. And so they made it on a budget with sets concurrent to season two. And it's like, because no one gave a fuck, he got to do whatever he wanted. And it's amazing what he's able to kind of, he pulled in all his 12 monkeys people. He pulled in like his music people, like nuts. Or maybe, or maybe, uh, you know, this is the, the butthurt internet nerd me is that these guys knew all along what the fans wanted. And instead of doing a show that would have been commercially successful and recaptured and connected with past viewers, they fed you whatever parallel tale of Brexit uh, Patrick Stewart wanted to force down us in season one and then whatever the fuck season two was. And only by the end when CBS has a, a gun to their head saying, make money with this goddamn thing, do they punch the glass box on the wall and take Star Trek out and say, fine, here's this goddamn thing. Because it's the same, Met- you know. Metallus was, was Metallus was a a PA on Voyager. He's personal friends with Jerry Ryan. That's how he got back in the door. Uh, like he's a guy who worked on Berman Era Trek, and he was out and weaseled his way back in because Jerry Ryan got him back in. And so when someone had to take it over, he actually does. He knows the assignment. Like he used to work sure. on the show. So it isn't just like, oh, they all knew all along and then just finally decided. That's kind of what Strange New Worlds is. It's like Akiva Goldman kind of always knew how to make Star Trek and he just didn't want to. And then he just did suddenly one day. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's not bad. You know, good. I, I'm just wondering where this has been. Uh, this is, oh, no, I, I'm going to make Berman era Trek, except I'm going to treat it like a, a real TV production rather than. You know, like how uh, that thing where where Ethan Phillips talked about how like even adding a contraction, like yeah. and it's like required a five the red minute phone call, yeah, yeah, to the writers where he's like, no, nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna create more naturalistic dialogue and allow my actors to figure out the scene and then like shoot that, and you can tell like how because the acting is so good in it, it's because you're letting the actors figure out where to go with with what they're doing and like uh, the Todd Stanwick, I believe the guy's name is plays. Um, Shaw, the captain of the Titan, is phenomenal. And someone that was on the 12 Monkey show that Terry Metalis did for Hulu, I believe. And uh, everybody from the TNG cast is just like, they're unbelievably good because they're not tied into this really formulaic dialogue. They're like talking like people, but they're talking like they're characters. And it's so cool to finally have 
TNG get out of that shell that seemed to always be contain, con, you know, constraining it, and and finally what, like emerge into uh, what, what its shell full was flower. contained? I mean, we're we're starting to go a little long here, but like, what shell was containing? I mean, it had a format that propelled it to be one of the most uh, popular sci-fi properties of all time. Like, I always felt like TNG's dialogue in particular was very just boring. It just, the actors were good enough to try as, especially Joe, as time went on. Brainwashed. You're, you're watching the season three and it's like shooting fucking the <laughs> spiral pattern <laughs> hypnotism to you where you're saying uh, TNG actually sucked, but this new stuff. No, TNG was great, but it still had flaws. <laughs> DS9 was great. It still had flaws. It was still a product of its time. You know, these mm. shows were primarily shot in the 80s and 90s, and TV writers just weren't that good yet. They just fucking, fucking weren't. And they got better as time went on, and DS9 certainly, like, it, it, it went in directions no one saw coming and was very underappreciated in its period because it was something so different. But it was still very constrained by... The, the methods of the time that were just not good at natural dialogue and not good at trusting actors. Well, and we're in 2023 now. And it is better because of that. Voyager was flawless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's some comedic gems in the chat here. Anybody not around to read this, you're missing out. Uh, okay, so Joe, you have been uh, adequately brainwashed by this season yes. three. We'll see if they're able to stick the landing. We'll you see. You think if I'm you're... ever going to convince you to watch it? I'm actually sad we're not reviewing it. That's like my real takeaway. It, it, the show is good enough that I wish we were reviewing it right now. Well, I think take it. Take that up with season one. <laughs> take take that up with season one, man. I, mean, I, I, I get it though. I mean, as much as I wish I could convince you, I've had my dick slammed in the car door before. I'm I'm not chomping at it. Especially when we've got to get a, a lot of other good stuff out. And then, two man, just real quick, like Apple TV, the uh, for all mankind. That's watch that. Now Dude. it is it is hard to like make time given how much good TV there still is out there. I've been because I have a Paramount Plus subscription. I've been getting into those shows. There's good stuff there too. Like uh, actually, and I, the Pluto TV is really good, and that's a Paramount property. The two Star Trek shows or channels run at the same time. Like, there's a lot of TV out. There's a lot of good sci-fi out there. Like I'm saying though, like ch ch check out for all mankind. If you're you're looking at stuff now with these 2023 super high production good sci-fi glasses on, like put it up against some of the other titans out there, and and I'd be curious how you can compare and contrast that. Because I'm telling you. Apple TV's fucking killing it. I don't know what's going on with their formula over there, but for as bad as Disney Plus has fallen down the stairs, minus uh, Mandalorian. Although you said Andor is real good too, and that's another one I got to get around to. Well, yeah. how would you stack this up against uh, Andor? Andor might be the best television show I've seen. Better than Picard season three? Mm. I will see. I got to watch. So you're the saying Andor is better than Deep Space Nine, Joe? You're. It, I mean, yeah, fucking people out there with pitchforks. Deep Space Nine is really good. It it is. It it was so much better than anything that existed at the time, which is why I believe it's so beloved. But you know, it's like yes, you're you're, well. you're 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 your perfectly maintained 1968 hot rod isn't going to be as fast as a computer, you know, honed turbocharged Ferrari in 2023. Tesla. Okay. We'll it's you're, you're like it's it's still a fine piece of machinery and you love to return to it and you love driving it around and being in it uh and, it, and it's got a, a motor and it goes and it'll always give you a great time but it's sure as shit not the fastest thing you can buy it's not the best anymore it's familiar and fun in a different way so when I'm, i when so i say things are better than ds9 i'm not disparaging ds9 i'm just acknowledging time has has continued to to move forward and there the 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 medium in which we're they're working in has seen some overall improvement well you know the one thing i'm seeing in the chat here uh the and there to a certain level as we listen to voyager season eight no yeah season eight right that's uh that's jk's right Yes, it is. A man who hates Picard, by the way. <laughs> he's a man of certified good taste. hater. A man of good taste. You know, I, I listened to the, his most recent episode on that, and there's a lot of that I just got to gloss over because they start getting into the post uh, Dominion War talk and stuff that I just have no frame of reference, and I don't want spoilers. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I guess you really can't cool. watch season three of Picard because it is like, the entire plot requires you to have watched DS9. That's true. I mean, I'm I'm not a stick in the mud. Like, I'll watch this thing. I'll do a discussion. But if watching season three of Picard is really going to spoil and ruin a lot of DS9, that is a legit concern that I have. Okay. So I don't know. I'll think about it. Thank you to everyone in the chat that have participated. Looks like I had about a dozen people, which is pretty cool. It's huge. And my thanks to all of you who are listening. I to feel this. like we're in Antarctica, surrounded by listeners. <laughs> it's true. All of those poor Antarctic scientists that were somehow roped into listening to our takes. By God, if you are all still listening, we love you. And uh, this episode will be up in the podcast feed sometime tomorrow. And I believe our plan is next week we're going to be putting out finally our free previously Patreon only uh, review of uh, Strange New Worlds, which has been paywalled behind our Patreon for some time. Because actually, we're going to be reviewing Reanimator for our yeah. patrons here for shortly. Real this time. For real, we're actually getting to it. And so, real quick, while we got the chat people here, would you guys rather us uh, once we get back on the Patreon? Uh, movie review train do you think we should go with insurrection or should we jump back to either uh, motion picture or con and like start with the original series and move forward yeah we kind of like did generations because it was one i knew peter hated so i wouldn't be take and i really loved so it'd be an interesting discussion there but uh i would i would like to know as well if because the movies are a great patreon thing for us to do because they're all one and done and so we can kind of just do it and and put that up for the patrons and and it's timeless, you know, in that regard. Like we did the Strange New Worlds review and I, I don't think we we liked our product. We liked talking about it. You you watched it, which I was happy to get you to watch it. Uh, but it was a, a kind of a commitment to watch ten episodes to do a one hour show. So we like doing the movies. Yeah. Uh, don't do the motion picture. It's not worth the rewatch. There's a super good cut of motion picture that I will find. The one with the Daft the Punk soundtrack? Yes. Yes. And that's all you really need. And it's like, like 25 like... minutes and it's perfect. It's, yeah. Uh, yes. I, I agree we should probably not do motion picture, but uh, there seems to be um, a split between insurrection and going back to con. Um Oh, put a, and, put, a, put a, a poll up on the Facebook. And and Norman's here with wouldn't mind an occasional mess hall. In in here, I'm I'm pleased someone misses the mess halls. I mean, this is what yeah, I, and this is kind of what we're doing with this rip is like a mashup mess hall uh, uh, rip to see if the participations are. And I think it is. Yeah, we, I think I think we'd like to come back to doing rips as we push an hour and a half. And my wife is upstairs cursing me because I've stuck her with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, we'll we'll free Casey from her obligations, and we'll say thank you to everybody. Thanks for joining us, and you'll you'll see us uh, again next Thursday. It'll be a review, of Strange New Worlds, and and then after that, you'll start hearing about season three. See you guys.